This is Navy Beach, a hot spot for oceanography students to complete research projects while in MPS. To my right is Monterey Bay, MPS's large outdoor lab, so to speak. This area above water at low tide and underwater at high tide is called the intertidal zone and has become the focus of attention lately. Setting up the data gathering technology in this space is not easy, as we have seen in this video from last fall. Oceanography students work quickly to submerge seven sensors at intervals from the berm to the surf zone to the breakers. The sensors measure the thermal heating and cooling of the sand over the vertical as a function of tidal level and solar radiation. Placing the sensors on shore is much easier than at sea. They must fight the waves to put the rods in place, and one student must go underwater to make sure the sensor is positioned properly. In more recent months, Lieutenant Commander Darren Keeter has been performing a similar study at Navy Beach. Keeter has been monitoring this weather station, which has been measuring the natural forces affecting nearshore conditions. What I'm doing out here is a study of the microclimate of what's known as the intertidal zone. So it's the area extending from just offshore, just outside the surf zone, up to the dunes here in the back of the beach. And what we're doing is looking at how the influence of the tidal cycle, which you know migrates throughout the day when you have high and low tide, and the solar cycle, which is fairly constant, act together to create really strong gradients in temperature and humidity and other parameters right here in the uh, near shore area, a place that hasn't been as well studied just because of the very dynamic nature of it. This tower was custom built here at Naval Postgraduate School. Most of the stuff comes from Campbell Scientific. Part of one of the learning things for me was figuring out how to build the system, run the wiring and cabling, how to program the system, and then get it deployed. We've had it in a few variances, and we're measuring quite a few things. Uh, High-speed, three-dimensional wind velocity and sonic temperature uh, using what are known as sonic anemometers. And those are the ones that look sort of like egg beaters, and those are measuring at 20 times a second. We also have a water vapor sensor that's measuring changes in the water content of the atmosphere. Then we have a few other sensors, such as just our normal temperature and humidity sensors, uh, which are the little white cones that are on the side of the tower. The little pine cone shaped thing is to protect it from direct solar radiation so the sun doesn't cause the temperature sensor to get too hot. And then what looks like the Starship Enterprise over here is a sensor that's measuring the downwelling shortwave radiation from the sun, the reflected radiation from the sun off the ground, as well as the terrestrial longwave radiation, either from the earth or from the clouds. For our long-term measurements of temperature and humidity over this environment, we're using these temperature and humidity sensors that were built by a company called Onset. Originally, we put them at two meters and four meters above the sand level. The sand level has been changing constantly. We've had up to a meter of sand added and up to a meter of sand go away within a week's time frame. These are taking measurements every 15 minutes and they're doing it and logging it as a self-contained unit here. We're also looking at the temperature in the water near the surface as well as the pressure so that we know what the water level is. So hopefully this research, uh, which was funded by the Office of Naval Research, ONR, and there's some follow-on projects that will be coming afterwards, will help us get a better basic understanding of these scientific questions and allow us to move forward with better forecasting techniques. After gathering enough data, Keter collects the sensors and returns to the Oceanography Center to compile the results. Over the next couple of days is download the data from these, the temperature sensors and the pressure sensors. Fairly simple to get to. Um, it's all self-contained. It's a little USB plug that hooks up to here and download the data. Um, once you do that, then there's some processing that has to be done. The nice thing with the way systems are now is you can take it and carry it with you. You can do it at a coffee shop, you can do it at home, uh, you can do it between classes. Um, I'm starting to get to the point where some of the data that I need to crunch through, though, is a little more than I can do on the laptop. So I've got the uh, bigger hardware here just because I was literally crashing um, a MacBook Pro. The biggest thing I'm doing is converting a lot of data that came from the sensor, the big tripod that was out at the uh, beach. Those files are highly compressed, but when they're pulled apart, they're huge, and they contain literally uh, millions of observations in them. Estimated number of records in this one is 19 million, and it takes a long time for it to process. You know, you're recording for 
you know, a week at a time at 20 times per second at six readings per instrument that's doing that. And that's just a lot of data. A lot of the work uh, is done with MATLAB. Uh, primary thing that we uh, use around here for doing our analysis. Again, it's just a way to parse through a lot of the data, do some of the uh, display and analysis, and be able to start just interrogating and thinking about how the data is done. The arduous process of analysis doesn't deter Keter. He sees the value in such research and effort. Potential uses of this research and data are everything from uh, wind stress and how the wind stress dynamics change uh, due to the constituents of the atmosphere. So how much energy the atmosphere and the wind imparts on the ocean, you know, so how that would affect nearshore currents and waves. Um, could have the effect on the atmospherics, um, electromagnetic, electro-optic uh, propagation. So especially in the nearshore environment where we're concerned with things like communications over the beach, whether you're in a um, humanitarian assistance disaster relief situation where you have one of our big hospital ships just off the shore and you've got mobile hospital facilities on shore and you're trying to communicate back and forth between them and finding the optimum way to communicate and that communications path are seriously disrupted by rapid changes in temperature and humidity and other things in the atmosphere. And those kinds of things affect uh, higher frequencies as well such as computer technology, short path network for high bandwidth. Also affects radar or onshore by units that are onshore looking out to sea or by units that are on, you know, out to sea looking onto shore. Also of potential interest is, you know, how it changes the dynamics of everything else in the ocean as far as temperature goes in the near shore and whether or not those temperature variations can be linked to changes or interactions between the solar cycle, which is you know, fairly constant throughout the world, you know, barring clouds, and the tidal cycle, which isn't phased up with it. And we know how much energy the ocean can absorb from the sun. At certain times you have low tide and you have this wet sandy area that can absorb a lot of heat. We can measure significant heat transfer from the surface uh, down to over a meter uh, just through the uh, daily changes and the phasing between the sun and the tidal cycle. So looking at those interactions and how that might affect things such as uh, transport of contaminants in the nearshore environment. You can go back to humanitarian assistance disaster relief Fukushima um, out in Japan, for instance, there was contaminants in the water, and we really just don't know that much about how they transport around. Again, we get back to the wind stress and the nearshore currents, you know, do temperature uh, variations on a small scale that can affect densities, allow some things to transport out a little further, lower, you know, as, as it's cooler down below, even down to something such as sand transport and sediment transport, you know, which then remixes contaminants in the water. And that's particular interest because as we have ships, again, off the coast, you know, we make our own fresh water. We use that water for cooling of our systems and our equipment. And if we're in an area where there's contaminants, we have to make sure we steer clear of those. Uh, that was a big concern in Fukushima and one of the main reasons we were trying to get that right and working with DITRA and other interested parties to figure out how to measure those things, sense those things, and forecast those things. So these are just some of the areas that hopefully this research will be able to uh, help us out.